Creating a character is hard enough, but what about deciding on your entire party? How do you even really create a working party comp for Baldur's Gate 3? What if you make too many close combat characters? What about not having enough healing? Will you make it out alive without a rogue? We'll answer all these questions today by going over how to really create an effective party composition for your first or maybe your next playthrough of BG3. If this is your first time, my channel the way I do things is by upfronting the knowledge in my videos so you can decide if it's the right one for you. Now, with that being said, what we'll be talking about today is going to be pretty loose. There are no real hard and fast rules here. What I want to really impress upon you is that this game can be defeated by a party of four barbarians or four rogues. It doesn't matter. The first two difficulties are going to come down to understanding the game itself rather than the composition of your party. Will stronger, will super strong builds you see online trivialize things for you? Yeah, absolutely. Even the latter two harder difficulties, though, come down to proper action economy management and placement more than your actual build. But I will tell you that we'll be touching on how your main character, or face character as it is often called, will thrive with having a few extra points into charisma, and then an investment into one of three conversational skills. When it comes to the other three companions, it's all about making things that complement you or each other. Made a fighter? Go with a cleric, or even another supporting melee character like a paladin or a barbarian. Then flesh out the other two spots to either add to those first two characters' strengths or shore up their weaknesses. So if I made a fighter and a cleric, well, let's add some range potential with a sorcerer or a wizard to help us get some crowd control elements into the party as well. And maybe a rogue or a bard to help us with traps, lock picking, or other wily portions of the game. That's really the, the too long didn't watch this entire video. There's no wrong way to do this. So make a party that is fun for you. So if that's all you wanted to know, please feel free to shut the video down and get back to making the best party for yourself in BG3. Before you head out, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Each one of those things does help me out in a huge way. I've gone from something like 89 to 80% unsubscribed viewership because of your help, but that's a number I'd still like to get lower and every little bit helps. You can also check me out on Twitch, linked in the uh, description below. I do stream Baldur's Gate 3 and a number of other games. If you need help with any other subject in Baldur's Gate, check out my playlist linked below and at the end of the video. But let's get started here on creating the best party comp in Baldur's Gate 3. So before we actually jump into the video itself, I want to show off Baldur's Gate Wiki because what I'm going to talk about some things I might say, hey, you know what, plan out this character, take a look at this character, maybe look at what their abilities are, whatever it is. And the resource I'm going to give you, a link in the description here below, is for the BG3 Wiki because it's going to have every little thing that's going to happen from the character from level 1 to level 12 of any desired class. So when I say things again like, hey, take a look at what the fighter gets at this level or that level, see if you want this over that and then decide how to multi-class or do whatever. What I'm talking about is being able to click on the fighter over here and being able to see this chart. Okay, well, hey, they get an extra attack at five. I definitely want to get there. Oh, but they get a, a feed at eight. Let's bring myself to eight before I multi-class, whatever it is. So being able to kind of look at these things and then drill down onto the individual subclasses is going to be pretty huge for not just simply creating your character, but also building out how the rest of your party is going to interact with each other. You know, like, hey, I'm going to make a fighter, but Am I going to be a fighter that is going to worry or that is going to really help out the party with a lot of really cool utility being the battle master? Or am I going to be a super tanky fighter using the shield spell from Eldritch Knight? So you kind of get those things in your in your in your brain by kind of looking through and diving through some of these pages and then going, hey, I've made that kind of fighter. Well, you know what? I want to go with a cleric, like I said before. That is going to be a life cleric and really do a ton of healing. So you've got these, uh, this resource. But the other resource I also want to show off is this one here that will help you out when it comes to all of your spell slots. The big thing is, of course, trying to get to those max level of spell slots in 4, 5, or 6. Or I'm sorry, getting up to the 6 level spell slot. So you might tell yourself, hey, you know what? I'm going to be 2 levels into Paladin here. But then I'm going to put 10 levels into Bard. What does that get me? Oh, awesome. Look at all of these spell slots I'm going to get for these juicy Paladin Smites. Or maybe I'm going to take, um, let's go six levels into Wizard. And I'm going to take six levels into Ranger. I haven't even heard of that. But six levels into Ranger. Oh, okay, cool. I'm going to have a fifth level spell, which should be pretty juicy. But I'm still going to have some fun for my Ranger capability. So this gives you just another way or another method of planning out characters for yourself or for the entire party. But I wanted to show these off here, and you have those in the, as references in the, in the uh, description below. So loading into the game, the first topic to talk about is our main character, our face character, the one that's going to be doing all the heavy lifting. And 
And when I say heavy lifting, of course, this is the one that you kind of put the most effort into, right? You know, this is one you care about because it's your character. It's you in the world, whatever it is. And what I'll tell you is this is kind of going to create the future blueprint for the entire party. And, but you could even work reverse if you want to. Like if you've already played the game, you go, hey, you know what? This time around, I want to play Shadow Heart as a monk and not a cleric. Well, maybe you can kind of work backwards from there, but I'm assuming we're coming at this from the main character onwards and you don't really know much about what characters are coming your way. And that's okay. I just wanted to kind of uh, establish that first. So when it comes to selecting your class, what I'll tell you is just choose one. Choose the one that you that interests you the most, the one that you're kind of really interested in. Don't get stuck in the doldrum of reading something online that says, well, you know, yeah, the barbarian is pretty good, but you know what? You're not going to have a high amount of charisma, so you probably want to go with a paladin or a sorcerer or a bard. Yeah, sure, those are all three very strong characters that have super strong builds attached to them as well. But if you want to be an arcane wizard that has spent all their time pouring through books and learning things, then by all means do it. I'm going to show you how to kind of circumvent that absolute need to have super high charisma. What I'll tell you also is that high charisma kind of trivializes, and I've used that word so many times in the, in the last couple of days when it comes to this stuff, but it does trivialize a lot of the game. It's such a super blown out of proportion ability score that I think that if you approach this game saying, my face character has to have uh, 17 charisma, which is the max amount you can have here at character creation, you will push yourself through a lot of fights. You, you will, I'm sorry, you'll bypass a lot of fights with that charisma, sure. But that also changes the way you play the game. And approaching the game as a barbarian who just shouts at people rather than be charismatic is a total viable way to play. The game even has specific uh, dialogue options for you as a barbarian where you just shout at someone. You just straight up shout at them. You don't, <laughs> you don't even have like a coherent conversation. So you can have a lot of fun with these things. Don't think you're locked into one of these three or four, uh, I forgot Warlock in this list, predominant classes that focus on charisma. Don't. This is your main character. This is the one that you want to have the most fun with. You want to play an open hand monk that just uses wisdom and doesn't even have a little bit of charisma? Fine. I'll tell you from my personal playthrough, the one that I have, I'm the farthest, I'm just about to beat the game with, finally. It's a ranger. I'm playing a ranger and I don't have 16 charisma. I have... Uh, <laughs> what, do I, what do I have? I have 12 charisma. That's all I have on that character. And this is where this kind of comes to selecting your face class character. If this is your face character, the character that is the main one that's going through all the dialogues and all that stuff, all you really have to do to kind of shore that up is get 12 charisma because this gives you a plus one to all charisma checks, which are going to be related to these skill proficiencies. Deception, intimidation, performance, and persuasion are all charisma skills. So just simply having a plus one there is huge. And then from there, just try to have either an origin or a skill proficiency in one of these um, skills, persuasion, intimidation, or deception. One of those is a conversational skill, and it's really all you'll need. Yeah, are you going to fail some of those checks? Absolutely. But you're playing a ranger, and a ranger isn't always known for being someone that's going to craft their way through every conversation, and that's just fine. You don't need to break the game by only beating all the conversation scores because then you're just playing conversation simulator. Might as well play Sims at that point, which I can't wait for the next one to come out. A uh, hard segue. But now getting back to your class decision and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of create this character right here and we'll, we'll, we'll fill out the rest from this point on. So a big thing that comes down when it comes to your, your composition is do I need to go with multi-classing? What kind of multi -class? I don't even know what a multi-class is. You know, I, I barely passed, you know, English 101. All you really need to worry about is just choosing one and going with it. You can spend 12 levels into each one of these classes and actually be a very strong, very fun character. 12 levels of fighter is actually one of the strongest characters in the game. So don't worry about it. 12 levels of sorcerer is also stupid strong. 12 levels of wizard, warlock, monk, barbarian, it's all totally viable. You don't need to multi-class. And this way, if you're coming at this the first time, maybe you're brand new to D&D, &D, you're brand new to CRPGs, or the, you've played Baldur's Gate in the past and you didn't, and, and multi-classing and dual classing were a whole different beast and you didn't want to jump into it. Like I said, just go straight up, 12 levels into fighter, super easy. And it's very damn strong. A battle master fighter is a very strong character in this game. So what we'll do is, I'm going to assume that you're going to choose fighter for your main character. 
and I'm going to, I'm going to play around with these stats. Uh, this isn't a, a video talking about how you should set your stats out and what build you should go with. I've got a million build guides and there's so many on YouTube. It's an oversaturated point at this point. I just wanted to talk about how to go about approaching creating this party so that you don't feel so overwhelmed with the decisions coming your way. So um, let's just say we're going to be a super uh, strong fighter character right here. We'll use recommended there and I'll kind of tweak it from there. And we'll go ahead and drop that there. We'll put that to there. That should not be that high. There we go. That's a perfectly viable character. And we even we can even tweak a little bit more around here. There. That that'll do, pig. You know, that that that's just fine. I now have my point into intimidation, so I can be a real asshole fighter that kind of like gruffs my way through things. My background here is a charlatan, it's gonna give me deception inside of hand skills, so I don't have to worry about that. I usually kind of recommend people for their min maxing and not caring about background. I like Guild Artisan because it gives me persuasion for free. So now I've got persuasion and intimidation. So I can use both of those in conversations. And I get a plus one to those roles. So it's actually in truth, it's going to say it shows it right there, right? It says plus three. So it shows you um, that it reflects that specialization bonus plus the stat. So I'm pretty good for the majority of the game. And that that proficiency bonus is only going to increase from two to three to four eventually. So let's assume then your face character is going to be a fighter. And again, that could be anything you want. Maybe you went with a wizard instead or a cleric, whatever. So, but for the, for the sake of this video, I'm assuming you've gone fighter. Let's now talk about another subject before we get into party numbers two, three, and four. And it's about companions. And with that, I really want to focus again on choosing what you want. Don't jump into the game and go, well, you know what? Is Shadowheart really good? Doesn't matter if she's good or not because you build the character out yourself. Any one of these characters, yeah, sure. Shadowheart is a Char cleric. Lazel is a fighter. Um, Will is a warlock. Will's character maybe is really a big warlock from his story, right? Or Gale is definitely a wizard in his story. And, and um, Shadowheart is definitely a Char cleric in her story. But it doesn't matter. Change their, change their class around. Do whatever you want. And when it comes to the personality of the character, if you like it, then that's the one you're going to take. Go with your gut. You like things that are entirely different from the things that I like. You have experienced entirely different things in your life that allow you to like things and dislike things that I maybe don't like. And more often than not, I hate being myself. But I'll tell you what, I like my preferences. So if you prefer a character over another, disregard everything you've read online, disregard everything you've seen from YouTube videos, my own included, and just go with that character. If you want to go with the party of Will, Gale, and... um. Lazel, then do it. If you want to put Karlak in instead of another one of them, then do it. And swap their classes out as much as you want. You can stick with a lore kind of uh, trope if you want. Like, hey, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll multi-class Gale off of Warlock into something else. Or I'll keep um, Shadowheart along the lines of a cleric, but I'll, I'll, I'll still go into a different route. Do it if you want. Don't do it if you don't. Because at no point in the story they're going to go, well, you know, as a... Wait, am I still a cleric of Shar? Like they they don't care. You're, you're going to hear the story regardless. And yes, they they could be a cleric of Shar, but it could still be a worshiper of Shar. It, she doesn't necessarily say, "Oh, well, because I'm a cleric." She says, "Because I worship Shar." So have fun with this. Do whatever the hell you want, and do not think about your companions as anything other than things that you want to have along for the journey. And the next time you come about. Do it with a different set of them. Maybe you stick a couple ones that you like from the previous ones in there. Who knows? But just want to break apart that analysis paralysis because I think a lot of people get hung up on, well, do I want to take that character, this character? Uh, Will is a warlock. Well, can I make Will a fighter? Shit, yeah, you can. You paid money. You do whatever the hell you want. So let's now get into our next party member. So on to our second party member. And our first party member is that fighter we created, right? And I've, I'm have i using one of my other saves that I have. So you're going to see that it's a... Um, a tiefling fighter. But with that fighter, how do I want to complement them? And when the fighter, you kind of think of a character who's using heavy armor, who's using two handed weapons or a sword and a shield, or maybe even two weapons. So when it comes to kind of encapsulating that second class, think of maybe something that complements them up in the front row. Are they a fellow paladin that's going to sit or a fellow melee character, like a paladin who sits toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and fights alongside them? Are they a barbarian who just kind of throws fisticuffs? Whatever it is, kind of get that in your head as far as like, 
okay, do I want this this next character to kind of be one that complements them directly in that strength, right? It's two martial characters up close and personal doing damage. In my personal opinion, I like having one character that is going to be up close and personal. Even a monk, it doesn't need to be a tanky character wearing heavy armor. It could be a monk, it could be a barbarian, a paladin, a fighter, even a, a melee-based ranger, a, a war cleric, a, a moon druid that's shape-shifting, a sword bard, a blade pack warlock. It doesn't really matter. Just someone I, I like to kind of have in front because that person can then kind of divert the rest of the enemies either around them and hopefully causing opportunity attacks or kind of at least stymieing them from getting to my quote-unquote back line. So <clears throat> in this example here, we have our fighter, right? Our first, our first character is our fighter. So our second character, I think going very safe and generic is just fine, you know, going with a, um, a life or a light druid. Light druid, like 12, I'm sorry, with cleric, 12 levels into light cleric is stupid strong, actually. The light cleric is... Uh, probably one of the best domains just pure on its own. It's really, really, really good. I love it. In, in my playthrough, my main character is a ranger. Shadowheart is a 12-level light cleric. So what I'm going to do for that second character is I'm going to directly complement their weaknesses of my fighter by providing range spell damage, which the, the light domain focuses on. The light domain is really more of a quote-unquote blaster, as it were. But it also will help out because I'll get this ability, Warding Flare. The light cleric has an ability that can give disadvantage on attacks to them, but at level 6, they can throw this onto their friends. So, hey, you know what? My fighter's up close and personal. My light domain cleric is able to cast spells from the back line and also kind of help me out with this warding flare ability and has some healing capabilities. Now, I will say when it comes to healing, you do not need it in this game. Like diehard 5th edition D&D &D, really like super knowledgeable folk will tell you you don't need healing in the game. The best healing is just killing more. If you want to play a character that heals, then just do it. Go with a life domain cleric and just get a ton of healing. It doesn't matter. It's actually really fun to have super crunchy big heals. It's a really cool part of the game. But the light domain cleric still gets plenty of heals because it still is a cleric at the end of the day. So we'll go with this as our second character to kind of add a little complementary spice to the mix. And keep in mind, too. You might have characters that are going to overlap when it comes to like a fighter and a paladin when it comes to gear, right? They're both going to be wearing heavy armor maybe, and they're both going to be using two-handed weapons. There's plenty of items in the game to go around for that style. Lots of heavy armor choices, lots of two-handed weapon choices. What I will say, though, is you do want to have kind of a mind of what focus stat-wise you're taking with the remainder of your party members. Okay, my fighter, I'm going to focus on their strength. Cool. Done. Well, cleric is going to focus on wisdom. Okay. Well, that's two different. That's two different ability scores or stats, and I can focus on them differently. Well, when it comes to like a paladin, well, am I going to focus on my strength? Yeah, but you also probably want to focus a little bit on charisma because you're going to get a lot out of that, and that's where it kind of gets sticky. What if I want to have a warlock in my party who focuses on charisma? You, as the as the creator, have to really decide for yourself who is going to take the benefit of that stat over the other, right? Warlock and Paladin are, are examples of two characters that both use charisma, but the Warlock cannot do damage without charisma. So it needs that charisma. Versus the Paladin, yeah, I can fall back on all my, my close combat abilities. My smites don't do more damage because of my charisma. There's just other Paladin things that get benefits from my, my charisma. Okay, cool. That solves that. But what happens if I go between a Sorcerer and a Warlock? Well, again... There is a really good hat for Charisma Casters and a really good robe for Charisma Casters. There's still good alternatives to those, but they focus predominantly on taking Charisma benefits and adding to your Charisma score, scores, all that. So you would just decide for yourself, hey, you know what? My Warlock has really been sucking. This has not been doing damage. So I'm going to give the things that augment their damage directly to the Warlock. And the Sorcerer, I'm going to do things that maybe help their spell save DC or their spell attack rolls. So they have a higher likelihood of their spells hitting, but I want my Warlock to actually hit harder because he's just really not doing it. So you're going to juggle these instances. And if you're new to the game, you maybe don't know when or where or what those items are. That's okay. You're going to stumble upon it and find them in due time. And you're going to feel it out for your own party and go, shit, my Druid just really not doing any damage. 
I'm going to give them the wisdom item rather than my cleric. Whatever it is, you're, it's going to be unique to you and how you're playing and how you're enjoying that class and what damage you're getting out of them to determine who gets what item as it pertains to their primary stat. Now for our third character, we're looking at someone that's going to maybe add a little bit different spice into the party, right? Am I looking at my, I've looked at my fighter, my cleric, a very kind of generic way of approaching Dungeons and Dragons, right? A fighter, a cleric, a wizard, a rogue, ah, that's, there it is, you've got your four. <laughs> you can, And you could still go at that party and crush shit, by the way. So with this third character, let's think about some of the rules that we created in that previous character conversation, right? Who can augment my first character, my fighter? Well, I can go with another close combat character, like a paladin. I can do that. And I'm looking at Lazelle here, and I'm specifically doing this for, for a specific reason. Um, maybe, you know what? I want to support my fighter character with a ranged martial character in the sense of character, someone that's using like a bow and arrow or like a rogue, right? That can maybe get up close and personal and use the sneak attacks to do a little damage. But you know what? We have a cleric here. So the cleric's going to give me a lot of range, boom, boom. They're going to give me some healing, and they're going to give me a lot of really fun staying power. So you know what I'm going to do? Lazelle is a gith, and gith typically are also practiced monks. So I'm going to go with a monk. And this goes to my conversation about two characters that share a similar stat. Because clerics and, wist and monks, just like druids, all rely on wisdom and rangers. So I'm going to take a look at my stats here. And I'm going to focus on increasing my dexterity. I'm going to increase my constitution. And I'm going to increase my wisdom. And I'm not going to really worry about it. Because, oh, did I mess up this? Yeah, I went all wonkopotamus, which is uh, a term the Romans use. We all know that the Romans use the word wonkopotamus. I'm going to increase my strength a little bit because I like to. Um, we'll go with something like that. Actually, no. We will go with, yeah, I like that. We'll do that. We'll do that. We'll get, I would do something different with my, my, my build in, in a different time. But wisdom is different here for a monk than it is for a cleric. Because monks have this special unarmored defense. While not wearing armor, you add your wisdom modifier to your armor class. So I'm getting an decrease to my armor for my dex of plus three and my wisdom of an additional plus three. And the damage I can do for my monk later in their leveling, and this comes back to kind of planning things out using the uh, the BG3 wiki, I can look at, okay, well, hey, at, at this level, the monk gets a special stun, or they get this special uh, key resonance ability, and it's all kind of based off of my wisdom modifiers and stuff like that. Okay, that's how far down I'll go into this. And the difference, too, being is that a monk and a cleric, I, as a monk, am doing damage with my wisdom uh, helps to augment things. Whereas a cleric uses their wisdom, yes, too, to do damage, but it also is available spell slots and all these things. So when it comes to getting an item that maybe increases my wisdom, there's only one item in the game that does that, so don't worry about this. Um, but still, my point remains, I would probably default it to the character that needs it the most in the circumstance that it, it fills, right? Oh, my cleric, I need more spells, or I need their spells to hit more often. So let's go ahead and augment the wisdom on my cleric because my monk is still an up close melee character and I need their dexterity to be higher so they can actually do more damage with their fists. There's a whole conversation about tavern brawler monks I'm not getting into right now. But we can see here with a monk, we're going to augment the abilities of a fighter by being next to the fighter and being able to kind of throw quite literally fisticuffs with that fighter. And this also can be augmented further from the cleric who can heal the monk, increase their hit points using spells like aid, and also divert damage away from them because we went with a light cleric that can completely do that. And again, the monk has super mobile. So if someone gets in the back line up to next to that cleric, the monk can be there and it can help out. So this is how we kind of piece things together by kind of creating a web between these three characters that have an overlap. Let's now go to our last character. On to this last character. And just to recap here, we have a fighter, we have a cleric, we have a monk, and now we have another choice to make. And we have a character that can do some ranged spell damage with the cleric. We have a monk and a fighter that can be up close and personal and punch and kick the crap out of things. So what do we do now? And this can come down to whatever it is. You can, you can have kind of like a wild card. Like, hey, you know what? This doesn't really fit along with what I wanted. I mean, I could go with another, I could go with a barbarian in this mix right now and it'd still be just fine. And I've made a point too, to change Lazelle away from a fighter 
to show you that you can do a monk and she fits pretty well with her lore. And we know Will is a warlock and we know he has a pact with a demon. I know that all exists. And you could even then still go with a warlock and be fine in that party comp we just talked about. But let's think about some other things because we have a character that's really good at, at decent enough at conversating. We have a character here that is really good uh, with wisdom scores and stuff like that. And, and one thing to kind of mention too, that monk had very high dexterity. I could have gone with sleight of hand if I wanted to, you know, or stealth on the character, whatever it is. I mean, I'd have to get sleight of hand through a different means, of course. But my point still remains here that they have high enough dexterity. I, my ranger, I've, my ranger did, I did this. Urban tracker. So, and this is going to fall into what I was going to talk about right now is we kind of need someone that's going to pick locks, disarm traps. Do we need to? No, because you can break open all those things and be just fine. It doesn't destroy items like it did in previous Baldur's Gates. And you can kind of suffer your way through a lot of traps if you really want to. Let's go with a ranger here to showcase something. This character, we're going to go Natural Explorer because it gives him a proficiency in sleight of hand. And I'm going to make him someone that uses a bow and arrow in this case. So I'm going to drop this strength here. We're going to bring his constitution up. I'm going to do this. Let's actually do that. Yeah, let's not do that. <laughs> let's do that. There we go. Don't need intelligence at all. Put that up because I I hate dealing with uh, uh, carry capacity. And I'm gonna put stealth and sleight of hand. So and perception so I can spot traps. So this character, for all intents and purposes, could be the character that takes care of my traps, can stealth around, can pickpocket, can steal. Um, can pick locks, can spot traps with perception. It can be this character. It doesn't need to be that rogue or the bard. It doesn't need to go down that route if you don't want to. And yes, this is another wisdom-based character. But wisdom, when it comes to rangers, is just so much different than it is for clerics. You know, I'm 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 not thinking of my spells as the big driving force of what my ranger does. Yeah, my spells can help augment what my ranger does. You know, I can use lightning arrow at max level, like things like level 11 ranger or something like that. Or I can use an ensnaring strike and such and so on and so forth. But really what I'm doing as a ranger is if I'm a beast master, I've got a beast and I'm shooting a bow and arrow. Or if I am a Gloomstalker, I'm trying to really maximize my Gloomstalker abilities, which are really far and away from my spellcasting capabilities. So if I went with Ranger, that would be three different wisdom-based characters in this party, and it would be just fine. And even too, looking at the armor spread, this character is light and medium armor. This is a no armor character. This is light, medium, and heavy armor. It's a cleric, whatever, whatever you can slap on him. And the fighter is heavy armor. Well, light, medium, and heavy, right? But... This shows you we've spread across a bunch of different uh, stat layouts, right? We spread across a bunch of different armor layouts and we set a di bunch of different weapon layouts because the cleric is probably going to use a staff and a shield or maybe a mace and a shield if you want to go the classic route. The fighter is probably going to use a two-handed weapon and there's a lot of really good ones or sword and a shield or two one-handed weapons. Same thing here with that ranger, right? Am I going to use my bow and arrow? Am I going to use a two-handed weapon? We we have that flexibility to choose things. But what I will tell you is maybe don't have four characters that need heavy armor and two-handed weapons. There's enough to go around, but it's going to now come down to you choosing favorites. Who's going to who's going to get the hand-me-downs all the way down the character list? So this diversifies our characters, it diversifies our skills, it diversifies our equipment options, and it diversifies, even though we have a bunch of dex and wisdom characters, it diversifies the play style of each one of these party members. But even then over, uh, what? What does that mean? <laughs> one more over, we could simply just go with a bard. And I could simply go into my abilities and I could go with sleight of hand because Bard can learn every goddamn thing under the sun. So you don't have to stick with the things that the character would do from their um, from their story. I mean, a Bard still kind of fits the blade of the frontiers. Maybe he made a pact to be the best goddamn musician this side of Baldur's Gate. And that's what you're going to stick with. That's what you can kind of play with in your headcanon. And you can have fun with a character that is set up exactly like this. And you can do a ton of crap with them. Because bards can do fucking everything in this game. In all in all in D&D. &D. So 
when you kind of jump into the driver's seat of this and you're looking at it and you kind of say, okay, hey, you know what? Let's go with the bard. This is going to give me different spell casting than my cleric, right? I can go with some healing. I can go with some buffing, but I can also really lock people down with Tasha's hideous laughter. I can use dissonant whif- 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 whispers to frighten them and give disadvantages, right? I can charm someone. I can put them to sleep. I can really do a lot of crazy things here. So let's let's do that. Let's let's kind of set that situation up. And cantrips here, you know, vicious mockery to kind of like taunt someone and tell them that their mother smells like their father. I don't know what the hell that means. And we've got ourselves a party. So let's put this all together and kind of take a look at things for some closing thoughts. Now that we've created our four person party, let's take a look here, right? We've got a fighter, we've got a cleric, we've got a monk, and we've got a bard. We've got everything covered. And I showed you how you don't really need to take that very stereotypical route to cover it. Yeah, sure, the bard's going to be the one picking locks, and that's kind of a little bit of a stereotypical route, but we talked about it possibly being a ranger or being any other character that wants to take that dive towards not stealth of hand, <laughs> sleight of hand, <laughs> stealth or sleight of hand. Um, it can be a rogue, it can be whatever. We have our healer da- dash casting character back here in our cleric, and that's a route you can take, but it could be a wizard, it could be a sorcerer, it could have even been an ancient's paladin that I really focused on a lot of the healing capabilities. It could have been a land druid that I went with. This over here, we have our monk, and the monk is going to really augment me up and close and personal, right? Do a lot of really fun, big, heavy hits. But that could have been a barbarian. That could have been a paladin. It could have been a, a melee-based ranger. I could have had a range and a melee-based ranger in this class, in this group, and had and had a ton of fun. One is a beast master, and the other one is a hunter, or the other one is a gloom stalker. It doesn't really matter. So hopefully this kind of breaks apart some of that, again, analysis paralysis of creating a party comp. It comes down to creating this face character right here, right? This 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 character you want to be and then building your party around it. And you can see even that I didn't really go with like a super generic party here. We don't have a wizard. We don't even have a dedicated scroll casting character, right? We don't have anyone who uses uh, Michelob Ultra's orb, whatever the hell it's called. <laughs> Or magic missile. We had someone who's going to just shoot things with radiant and fire damage. Um, and yeah, you can think of every little nuance of, oh, but we need a cold damage dealer, a fire damage dealer, a, a thunder damage. Yeah, take the time to do that if you want. Have fun with this. Enjoy this process. Don't get so pigeonholed into thinking about how do I make a character that breaks the game because that's what the internet tells me to. Instead, make a character, you know what? Dude, the monk looks really good. I keep seeing a lot of cool gameplay for monk. And I'll tell you, uh, my honor mode character, Lazelle, our honor mode playthrough, Lazelle is a monk, and she just eats ass. It, it kicks ass. She kicks ass. She's so strong. She just kicks the crap out of everything. And it's it's so fun. It is so fun to have a character like that. And you can enjoy that. You can enjoy kind of taking those different approaches. Don't look at these characters and think, okay, it's got to be a very set it's got to be this build or that build you can just go pure classes and also have a great time so if you have any other advice to anyone who's approaching making a party comp go ahead and let it be known in the comment section below maybe you say hey yeah that this guy brought up a lot of really good good points but one of the biggest pitfalls i keep falling into and i keep seeing people do is that they don't have someone with medicine to make potions and I, I I recommend you do something like that. Whatever it is, let it be known in the comment section below. Your experience at Baldur's Gate 3 is going to be different than mine. And my understanding of how action economy works or how I should do things in the game is going to be different than yours. So all those things matter. So just take a look at it. Take some time. Have some fun with this process because I wish I could go back and and go about this game for the very first time. I've put hundreds of hours into it and I absolutely love it, but I wish I could experience for the first time again with so much mystery attached to all these classes and these characters and and so much fun. Don't get too bogged down in it. Enjoy this process because you'll never be able to do it again, right? But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.